How many of you have ever seen one of these things? How many of you would admit to having one of these things? Well, not now. Well, if you have one now, we've, this is a whole other message probably. Um, yeah. Well, some of the little kids may have one now. Any, anybody used to have one of those? I used to ha- I have one of these. I can't remember which birthday it was for. I can't remember if it was my fifth or sixth birthday. Um, I got this, this punching bag clown thing. And I can, I can remember the first time it was already inflated. Like, I didn't have to take it out of the box and inflate it. It was inflated when they gave it to me. And, you know, Dad kind of shows me what to do. He kind of pushes it down, and I'm like, oh, okay. So I can't push my sisters, but I can push this. This is awesome. And so I kind of, like, push it, and it pops right back. And so then, you know, as a little kid, you're like five or six, you kind of, kind of half punch, half push, you know, and it pops back. And it, it had an, this one doesn't have it. They used to have the nose actually stuck out. Like, and it would make a noise, like when you'd hit the noise. And I just remember that the second time I pushed it, it like bounced back, it just like right in my face. And then the next time it's like, all right, so you just, bam, man, you just hit it. And the thing falls down and it pops back up. And then, you know, you kick it and it falls down and it backs. And eventually it ended up outside because mom wouldn't let me swing a baseball bat in the house. But, <laughs> but like you can take a baseball bat and just like wham, and he'd fall and he'd pop right back up. And it was this crazy thing because this clown wasn't strong at all. It had no ability to duck or defend itself. Yet there was something about it or there was something within it that kept it bouncing back. We can learn something from this clown. Life kind of comes at you with just a fury of fists and and problems and and circumstances. And the problem is, is sometimes... People get knocked down and they just don't get back up. They just stay down. And they become bitter and they become broken and they become just beat down. Others have some bounce back to them. Joseph had some bounce back. Think about some of the blows. Just think about where we've been in Joseph's story so far. Think about some of the blows that Joseph has been dealt already in his life. Right? Anybody? What, what has he had to deal with already? Some blows that Joseph had to deal with. Separated from his family. That was, I mean, as, as much as there was a dysfunctional family, it, it's still to be separated in that distance in a brand new culture, different place, different locale, definitely a blow. Hatred from his brothers. He had to deal with that. Uh, you think about that story. <laughs> they wanted to kill him. Seriously. Planned it all out, plotted it all out, had it all figured out. And and the only thing that kept them from killing him was they couldn't make any money on that deal. That's the only thing that kept them from killing their brother was the fact that they weren't getting anything other than his absence as as a result. They wanted something a little bit more. So they sold him into slavery. He separated, right, from his family. The lies of Potiphar's wife land him in prison, the broken promise of the cupbearer keeps him there. That's what keeps him in prison. This guy makes a promise, breaks his promise, and he's two more years in this prison. And if this were, if we were watching a movie unfold, or, and, and this was, you know, kind of, this is where kind of like the Rocky theme music would start, you know, dun 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 Because he's like, it's just like one thing after another. And, and all of a sudden, he's going to, he's going to rise from this. He's going to recover from these blows. And by God's strength, Joseph pulls himself to his feet and stands. And in just a moment, we're going to read this morning, he would stand stronger than ever in the court of the most powerful man on the face of the earth. He would stand boldly there. This guy that has just been hit. And one thing after another, another disappointment, another discouragement, another loss, another whatever. And he would stand stronger than ever in Pharaoh's court. So we're going to dive in this morning into today's section of Scripture, and I, and I pray that we discover what happened in the life of Joseph that we can learn from, but even more important, importantly, what we can apply in our lives today, because God doesn't waste ink. He doesn't waste time. He gives us the things that we need to know, just not for educational purposes, not just for knowledge. It's one thing to be able to recite a story back to somebody. It's a whole other thing to actually live that story out, to live out that story that God wants to write in your life. So this morning, 
If you have a Bible, I hope you do, because the verses won't be up. I'll, I'll show you where they're at, but all the verses won't be up here because there's a lot of reading. Um, guys, there's Bibles near you, so if you need a Bible, reach down. Slide next to a friend that has a Bible. Um, we're going to spend a lot of time reading in Genesis 41 today. So Genesis chapter 41, that's where the story is going to kind of kick off. Genesis 41, verse 1, says, after two whole years, reference. The reference is to two more years of Joseph being in prison. That's, that's where we start out, chapter 41. Kind of a weird chapter division, to be really honest with you, because it starts out with the, the, the words, after two whole years. And like, had you not read any of the story before? Like, after two whole years of what? After two whole years more of Joseph's imprisonment, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile. And behold, there came up out of the Nile seven cows, attractive and plump, and they fed in the reed grass. I thought the description was kind of interesting. I think you have to have raised cattle to call them attractive. You know, it's like they were attractive. Cow's a cow in my book, but apparently that's not true. They were attractive and plump, and they fed in the reed grass. And behold, seven other cows, ugly and thin, came up out of the Nile after them and stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. And the ugly, thin cows ate up the seven attractive, plump cows, and Pharaoh awoke. To me, this doesn't sound like a big deal. But if this is your life, if this is your livelihood, and you're making sure you're raising cattle, and you see big fat cows getting eaten up in your dream, that probably wakes you up. That probably, and, it, and it wakes Pharaoh up. And he fell asleep in verse 5. He says he fell asleep and dreamed a second time. And behold, seven ears of grain, plump and good, were growing on one stalk. And behold, after them sprouted seven ears thin and blighted by the east wind. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven plump full ears... And Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. So in the morning his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was none who could interpret them to Pharaoh. So recap real quick. He has these dreams. He has these two dreams, and they leave him incredibly troubled. He's he's really disturbed about what does this mean? You know, cows are eating cows, and, and ears are eating, you know, stocks are eating stocks, and what does this mean? And he asks all of his counsel, and no one has a clue. No one has an idea. No one knows what to, what to respond. And then something amazing happens. Let's keep reading. Then, I think this is kind of interesting, then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, hey, I remember and, 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 and we're kind of outside of the story, reading it, going two whole years, and now you remember. Now, he says, I remember my offenses today. When Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me and the chief baker in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, we dreamed on the same night, he and I, each having a dream with its own interpretation. A young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. When we told him, he interpreted our dreams to us, giving an interpretation to each man according to his dream. And as he interpreted to us, so it came about. I was restored to my office, and the baker was hanged. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they quickly brought him out of the pit. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in. Before Pharaoh, think about this scene for a second. Put yourself, kind of try to put yourself as a fly in the wall in Pharaoh's court that he's really troubled and he's asking for an interpretation for this dream because it's really bothering him. He doesn't know what it means. And all of a sudden, the cupbearer, we would probably call him the butler. He was the guy that was always at the side of the king, always there to kind of do whatever the king needs done. He kind of says, Oh, yeah, I remember this guy when I was in prison. Remember that? We don't want to talk about that a lot, but remember when I was in prison? And this guy, he interpreted our dreams and they were true. And Pharaoh basically kind of snaps his finger. And this flurry of activity takes place. All these people are rushing around. They go in and they grab Joseph. And within a few minutes, he's escorted into Pharaoh's throne. Think about this. Think about just the contrast between these two guys, right? Pharaoh is the king. Joseph is an ex-shepherd, ex-slave. Pharaoh is very urban and he's sophisticated. Joseph is rural and uneducated. Pharaoh's home is the palace. Joseph's last residence was the pit. Pharaoh wears gold chains, and Joseph wears bruises from his shackles. Pharaoh has armies and pyramids and wealth, and Joseph has some borrowed clothes. But Joseph's not phased by any of this. Let's read on. Verse 15. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I've had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. 
I've heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph answered Pharaoh, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, behold, in my dream, I was standing on the banks of the Nile. Seven cows, plump and attractive, came up out of the Nile and fed in the reed grass. Seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and thin, such as I had never seen in all the land of Egypt. They raised good cattle. Brother Steve, I'm pretty sure you said, I've never seen a thin, ugly cow. That's not what they raised in Egypt. And he says, the thin, ugly cows ate up the first seven plump cows. But when they had eaten them, no one would have known that they had eaten them, for they were still as ugly as in the beginning. And then I awoke. I also saw in my dream seven ears growing one on, on one stalk, full and good. Seven ears withered, thin, and blighted by the east wind sprouted after them, and the thin ears swallowed up the seven good ears, and I told it to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. So Pharaoh basically says, hey, Joseph, I've heard good things about you. I heard that you interpreted dreams, and Pharaoh just kind of shares what those dreams were that he had, and so now Joseph goes to work. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has revealed to, jo- to Pharaoh, I'm sorry, God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dreams are one. He's saying basically, hey, Pharaoh, the two dreams you had, actually these two dreams mean the same thing. The, the good cows, the good ears, they're kind of, it's the same dream. The seven lean and the ugly cows that came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty ears blighted by the east wind are also seven years of famine. It is, as I told Pharaoh, God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. Verse 29, there will come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt, but after them there will arise seven years of famine, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. The famine will consume the land, and the plenty will be known will be unknown, I'm sorry, in the land by reason of the famine that will follow, for it will be very severe. In essence, what he says, he says, you're going to have these seven years of incredible, like, bumper crops. They're going to be huge. But the seven years that follow this are going to be so severe that you're not even going to remember the seven years of good that you had. Verse 32, and the doubling of Pharaoh's dream means that the thing is fixed by God, and God will shortly bring it about. Just think about this a second. What the news that, that Joseph had just shared with Pharaoh would completely cripple the Egyptian empire. The, the only reason that Egypt was the jewel of the Nile is because of their agriculture. That's what made Pharaoh so powerful. Their entire civilization was based on farming. That's how they grew to power. That's how they grew to be such a, a well-known empire in that day and time. It was all about the farming and the agriculture and all that kind of came from the Nile River. And basically what Joseph was saying is, your crops are going to dry up, which means the Nile River will turn into like a little trickle. You're not going to have anything available for these crops and, and, the, and, your, and your cattle and all these things to feast on. So in essence, you're going to lose power in dramatic ways. And this was devastating news. So just think about this. If you're a fly on the wall in the, in the throne room of Pharaoh, he brings in this ex-slave that just got kind of fixed up. They threw some clothes on him. And he basically interprets the most powerful man on the, in the world's dream to him. And he said, by the way, this is devastating. What do you think was being, what the response was going to be at that point, in that, in that place, in that room that day? What do you think the response would be? Kind of like the response right now. Crickets, right? Just nothing. Like, whoa. And what's amazing is Joseph takes advantage, in a sense, of this pause in conversation, and he offers a solution. Let's keep reading a little bit more here. Verse 33. Joseph's still speaking. He says, Now, therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh proceed to appoint overseers over the land and take one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven plentiful years. And let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh for food in the cities and let them keep it. That food shall be a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine that are to occur in the land of Egypt so that the land may not perish through the famine. Did you, did you just kind of pick up on what happened just now? Think about this. This guy who's kind of the lowest guy in the kingdom basically comes in. 
He interprets the dream of Pharaoh. He gives him devastating news. And if that's not enough, he now begins offering solutions. It's one thing to tell the king the bad news. It's another thing to start offering solutions when your advice was never asked for. The king didn't say, Joseph, what do you think we should do? Joseph just kind of takes advantage of this pause in conversation to say, hey, by the way, here's what I think you should do. Pretty amazing. As I was reading the story and I'm looking at Joseph, in all of these situations, Joseph never, there's never a hint of fear in Joseph. He doesn't come in kissing the rings and, and bowing to the feet of Pharaoh. He doesn't do it. He doesn't stand there trembling and and shaking and afraid. Had that been me? I mean, this guy, a word, and they just take your head off. That's just kind of how things happen in Pharaoh's world. And if he didn't like the news, he just got rid of you often. Think about this. He hung a baker. I mean, what could the baker have possibly done? Like cooked a bad cupcake one day, and he kills him. So now uh, Joseph walks in, undaunted by all of this, says, hey, here's some bad news. Here's how I think you should fix it. Think about the contrast. Again, Pharaoh, the most powerful man on the face of the earth. There was no one on the face of the earth more powerful than this guy. And he's cold cocked by all this news of famine. And Joseph, the lowest person in the pecking order, This guy is an ex-slave, he's a convict, he's also an accused sex offender. That's Joseph's resume to this point. Ex-slave, convict, accused sex offender. And he's calm, completely calm. What made the difference? What's the difference between this powerful man that's now just completely troubled by this news, and this guy who has this checkered past, who really doesn't have anything established for himself within the kingdom, how come he's so calm and the the most powerful man and the face of the earth is just bothered? Yeah, let me share with you a word. Ballast. Ballast. You know what a ballast is? A ballast is a weight. I came to find out because I was little, I didn't understand why the stupid thing, like every time I hit it, it would pop back up. I, I, I later, it, like the, it got the better of me. I was kind of, kind of curious about stuff. So after hitting it so many times with a baseball bat, it eventually loses air, you know, kind of developed a hole. And so I decided, I was kind of one of those kids that when I was little, like if I wanted to learn how things work, I just took them apart. The problem was I couldn't rarely figure out how to put them back together. That's why I love people like Greg and people like that that I call on a regular basis. Once I screw something up completely, I call them up and say, please fix this. I did that same thing with this clown in a sense. I cut the bottom of it out. I had to figure out why doesn't this thing topple over? You know why? There's a three pound lead weight in the bottom of this thing that acts as a counterbalance. Joseph had something similar. It wasn't a lead, it wasn't a lead plate. It wasn't it wasn't anything of that, of that fashion. It was a deep-seated, stabilizing belief in God. That was his ballast. That was his weight. That was his anchor. It was this deep-seated, stabilizing belief in God. Let me show you a few things. You may have seen these. These things may have already popped up to you, uh, for you as we were reading through the story a little bit. But I want to show you some of the things that, that popped out to me as I'm reading through this story it goes right back to the very first sentence that, that Joseph ever speaks to Pharaoh. Back in verse 16, Joseph answered Pharaoh, It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh, Pharaoh a favorable answer. The second time Joseph speaks, he explains that God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. Again, in Genesis 41, verse 28, it says, It is As I told Pharaoh, God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. And then Joseph interprets the dreams of Pharaoh, and then he tells Pharaoh that the dreams were fixed by God, and God will shortly bring it about. If you're adding it up, in four verses, Joseph references God seven times in four verses. That was his ballast. That was his anchor and it's something that we've seen before in the life of Joseph. Do you remember, what did, what, did, what did Joseph say when Potiphar's wife 
propositioned him. Do you remember what he said? Yeah. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And then when the, when the, the two guys, the, the cupbearer and the baker, were in prison, when he said, hey, I, we'd like for you to interpret our dreams, do you remember what Joseph says? He says, do not interpretations belong to God? Joseph never hoped for personal accolades. He didn't worry about personal promotions. He anchored his hope in the promise, the provision, and the power of God. See, Joseph lived his life with this incredible awareness that God was able and God was up to something significant. He was aware of that all the time. And Joseph was right. I want you to watch. Watch these stunning turn of events. Verse 37 of chapter 41. This proposal that Pharaoh never asked for, that Joseph volunteered, kind of at the risk of his own neck, this proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find a man like this in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has shown you all this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. Can I ask you a quick question? I mean, this is kind of like not in the notes or anything. Was Joseph looking for this gig? Was Joseph, was his push, I got to be top of the heap, king of the mountain. We live in a screwed up world, you guys, where that tends to be the thing that we constantly shove people towards. And as parents, we're even guilty of it with our kids. If you're going to do this, you've got to be top of the heap, king of the mountain. You've got to be the best there ever was. How about this? How about we be the best that God wants us to be? And we just leave the results up to him. Why don't we just try that for a little while? And maybe our kids wouldn't be so freaked out about stuff. Just a thought. That was free. You don't have to pay for that. Verse 40, you shall be, Pharaoh speaking to Joseph, you shall be over my house and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Did you just pick up on what just happened? The dude that... Joseph served that threw him in prison. Guess who that dude's now serving? Kind of an interesting change of events. He was pulling security for Pharaoh. Guess who he has to pull security for now? And, And Joseph didn't have to push himself to the front. Joseph didn't have to clamor and climb and, 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 and plot and plan and strategize and figure out, hey, how do, I, how do I finagle through here? How do I worm my way in here? How do I get in front of Pharaoh so I can get myself up the ladder? And we're told in our world today that that's the way to the top, that you just continue to do things, whatever you need to do to shortcut the system, get yourself in front, get yourself promoted, get yourself acknowledged. And I think God's saying, hey, if you just leave it to me, I'll take care of all of this. I'll take care of all of this. Just... Just relax. You shall be over my house, verse 40, and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I've set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring. This is a big deal, you guys. You've got to go back and read through their culture in these times. He just took his, he takes his signet, let me read it so you kind of see what's happening. Then Pharaoh took his signet, re, signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand. That's, I know we look at this and go, he gave him a ring, what's the big deal? That ring had within it engraved initials or a sign that basically when you stuck it, when you sealed a document or you, or you made a declaration, it was sealed with wax and you would press that ring into that wax to say, on the authority of the king, this goes. He just handed that ring to Joseph. That's crazy. But our God's not above doing crazy stuff. And he put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments of fine linen And put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him ride in a second chariot. And they called out before him, bow the knee. Wow. And thus he set him over all the land of Egypt. Can you think about this, the the dichotomy of location? He begins the day forgotten and shackled in prison. He ends the day riding second in command to Pharaoh alone. That's incredible. What an, what an unexpected rebound. I was looking at and studying through Joseph's life, 
when I told you I've been reading a book that I read a while back, it was an awesome book, and it's, it's kind of opened the door and opened my eyes to some of these things that I hadn't seen before and caused me to study further. But when you look at Joseph's life, I count one broken promise, at least two betrayals, one unjust imprisonment, several outbursts of hatred, two abductions, a seduction, ten jealous brothers, one case of poor parenting, and a partridge in a pear tree. You know, it's just like... Wow. And if you mix this all together and you let it sit for 13 years, what do you get? You mix all this horrible stuff, these rejections and betrayals and imprisonments and abductions and hatred, and you, and you mix it all together and you let it sit for 13 years, which is what it does, what do you get? You get one of the most incredible stories of bouncing back in the Bible. You get an incredible story. Joseph, who was powerless against his brother's scheme. Joseph, who was powerless while he stood on the slave block. Joseph, who was powerless as he was ripped away from service in Potiphar's home and unjustly thrown into prison, is now the second most powerful man in the world's most powerful nation. Can I ask you a question? Don't you think God took this mess and made something good out of it? I mean, it wasn't easy, right? It took 13 years. This wasn't painless. There was was heartache, and there there was difficulty, and there was discouragement, and there were all these things in here. But God takes this mess, and he makes it into something good. So let me ask you, don't you believe that God can do the same thing with my mess and your mess? Why do we get so locked into, well, I screwed up, And this is just how it's going to be. That's not the message of the Bible at all. If you need to, let me encourage you. And I don't, I hate to encourage you with this stuff because I I, I don't like the direction it takes. But let me, bear with me for a second. Add up all the bad stuff in your life. Not right now, because some of you it's going to take a while. Um, (laughs) But add up all the bad stuff, you know, all the, all the things that just hurt your heart and all the times you were just disappointed and all the times that you thought that was going to happen, but it didn't happen that way. And, and what you got wasn't what you expected and it wasn't as good as you wanted. And add up all of this stuff. And while you're making your list, let me ask you, is the God of Joseph still in control? Is he still on the throne? Can he do for you what he did for Joseph? Here's another one. Could it be possible that all the evil that's harmed you could actually be turned to help you become the person God wants you to be? Is that possible? As believers, there will be a day, and I hope it happens in this life. I hope we don't have to wait till eternity to do this. But there's going to be a day where you add up all your hurts and all your heartaches. And you know what your sum is going to be? You add all this up. You tally it all up. You add it all together. And you know what you're going to say? All good. It all equaled good. And I know that doesn't seem like the case right now because you're like, I've got a list of bad stuff. And the list of good stuff just isn't outweighing it. It took 13 years for God to pull this all together to equal good in the life of Joseph. What's interesting is God's wired us with this internal yearning that all the bad stuff will end up good. Last week, um, this past week, I I asked some of you guys to weigh in and share with me your favorite movies. And and you want to know what the resounding theme was from almost all of these, with the exception of like Dumb and Dumber, that one doesn't count. But... (laughs) Do you know what the resounding, everybody who looks, they know, that's the bad thing about Facebook, because if you don't private message, everybody knows who said that one. So, I'm not calling out any names. But you know what the resounding theme was of those movies? The resounding theme was redemption. Redemption. At the heart of the stories we love, the movies that we really love, there resonates a message of restoration and redemption. We want to believe that even if things started bad or if things turned bad, 
that all is not lost. We, there's something within us. And you guys, it's not something manufactured by culture. I believe it's something wired within us, hardwired within us, that God himself has placed into the hearts of mankind that you want to believe that if it started bad or it turned bad, all is not lost and something good will come from it. You love those stories. That's why there's so many movies made with those themes and books written with that idea. We want to believe that good will ultimately triumph over evil. We want to believe that. Where does that come from? God. It comes from God. It, it's part of his image pressed into the hearts of man. That we want to believe that somehow all this brokenness will be overcome and there will be healing. We just want that. Why? Because that's the story God wants to write for us. It's the story he has written for us. Lieutenant Sam Brown had this belief. He said an unwavering belief in the God that restores and redeems. Two years out of West Point, Lieutenant Brown was on his first tour of duty in Afghanistan when an improvised explosive device tore through his Humvee. He doesn't remember how he got out of the truck. He does remember rolling in the sand and slapping dirt on his burning face, running in circles and finally dropping to his knees. He will lift flaming arms to the sky and cry out, Jesus, save me. Sam's words were more than a desperate scream because he is a devoted believer in Jesus Christ. Sam was calling out to his Savior to take him home. He assumed he would die. But death did not come. His gunner did. With bullets flying around them, he helped Sam reach cover. Crouching behind a wall, Sam realized that bits of clothing were fusing to his skin. He ordered the private to rip his gloves off the burning flesh. The soldier hesitated and then pulled. With the gloves came pieces of Sam's hands. Sam winced at what would be the first of thousands of moments of pain to follow. When vehicles from another platoon reached them, they loaded the wounded soldier into a truck. And before Sam passed out, he caught a glimpse of his singed face in the mirror, and he didn't recognize himself. That was September 2008. Three years later, Sam had undergone dozens of painful surgeries. Dead skin had been cut away and healthy skin harvested and grafted. The pain chart didn't have a number high enough to register the agony he felt. Yet in the midst of the horror, beauty walked in. Dietitian Amy Larson since Sam's mouth had been reduced to the size of a coin, Amy monitored his nutrition intake. He remembers the first time he saw her, dark hair and brown eyes, nervous and cute. More important, she didn't flinch at the sight of him. After several weeks, he gathered the courage to ask her out, and they went to a rodeo. The following weekend, they went to a friend's wedding, and during the three-hour drive, Amy told Sam how she had noticed him months earlier when he was in ICU covered with bandages and sedated with morphine and attached to a breathing machine. When he regained consciousness, she stepped into his room to meet him, but there was a circle of family and doctors, so she turned and left. The two continued to see each other. Early in their relationship, Sam brought up the name Jesus Christ. Amy was not a believer, but Sam's story stirred her heart for God. Sam talked to her about God's mercy and would eventually lead her to Christ. Soon afterward, they were married. Today, they're the parents of two small children, a boy and a girl. Sam is running for political office in North Texas as he continues to direct a program to aid wounded soldiers. Why did I share that story with you this morning? Because Sam and Amy have come to believe this, that God's math doesn't work the same way ours does. They believe that war plus near death Plus, agonizing rehab equals a wonderful family with incredible hope and purpose in this life. They believe that God's math just works different than ours. See, we start to add up all the bad stuff, and we think this has to conclude with something bad. And God says, I'm not finished yet. I'm not done yet. They understand that in God's hands, intended evil becomes eventual good. Before we close this morning, I want to encourage you in any way I can to know that with God's help, each and every one of you, each and every one of us can bounce back. 
Whether you've, you've slid way off or you've stumbled a step, it doesn't matter. You can bounce back. There's a road, there's a way back. Think about this for a second. Think about the life of Joseph. Do you think on the morning of Joseph's promotion, do you think he thought by the end of the day he would be the prime minister of Egypt? Do you believe that, like that morning he woke up and his prayer was, okay, God, by the end of the day, I want to be the prime minister of Egypt. That's what I prayed. It's a crazy prayer. I would caution us praying it with such assumption. But I have to believe he probably did pray, God, give me the grace to just make it through this day. Give me the grace to just make it through this day. God, help me see you and hear from you. Help me just gladly serve you and help me follow you completely. And because Joseph focused on God and humbly followed him, God exceeded Joseph's wildest dreams. Do you know the scriptures tell us that we have a God that does exceedingly, abundantly, above all we ask or think, according to the power that's already at work in you. Gosh, we have a big God who can take all these things that look catastrophic and turn them into something that's for our good and for his ultimate glory. Let me share with you. Joseph's story is is one of the most exciting stories of God's power and plan and action in the Bible. It's it's an incredible story. Spend time there. I hope you do. But the thing I want us to know before we stop this morning is that same power that took Joseph from a prison, that took him from a pit to Potiphar's house to a prison to prime minister of Egypt, that same God with that same power is alive today and offers that same power to each and every one of us that accept him. And I want you to know that he has a plan for your life. And he wants you to live it out and experience it. We're going to close up here in just a second. But here's how our story begins. It's dramatic turnaround. Just listen for a second, if you will. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 starts out this way. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. And and before you get really offended by that, verse 3 says, all of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger just like everyone else. Do you think God's angry with you because you're a sinner? Talk to me, guys. Come on. Is he angry with you because you're a sinner? Is God just so incredibly displeased because, doggone it, you keep messing up? Do you think that's what God feels? No. He's angry because he wants a relationship with you and he knows the direction you're heading and he begs to have you come to him. That's what disturbs him in his heart. It's not about what you've done. It's where you're headed. But God, I love this, by our very nature, we're subject to God's anger. Because he desperately doesn't want to see us walk away. He doesn't want to see us spend an eternity in hell. We were subject to God's anger just like everyone else. But I love verse 4. But God is so rich in mercy. And he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. You think that was a huge momentum change and a huge location shift from the prison to the prime ministership? Let me share with you. God just told you he's wanting to do something in your life greater than that. He said, I'm taking you from being dead to being alive. You can't, there's nothing bigger than that. Uh, Like, yeah, but I was in prison and now I'm the prime minister. I don't care. I was dead and now I'm alive. Because of God. Because his mercy and his love Verse 6, for he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms. How many of you have had a seat in the heavenly realms? Anybody done that already? You guys kind of pulled up a table in heaven and kind of kicked back? No, you know why, it, you know why this is such an awesome verse? He says that he's raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us, seated us, 
Already done. Seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Our future belief, our future hope in God's mind is a present reality already. We always talk about, well, one of these days I'll fly away. One of these days I'll get to heaven. God says, as soon as you place your faith and trust in me because of what my son did for you on the cross, you're there. You're in. That's what he's saying. You're already there. Why do we live like we're not? Why do we live like paupers when we're children of a king? So God, he says, he did this so God can point to us in all the future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us, as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. You ever, you ever do something kind for somebody just because you wanted to? You know, you just did something, you extended yourself, you gave, it wasn't like they, they earned it or whatever, you just did something kind. And, and, and have you ever had that opportunity when you've done something kind and, and that person is so thankful and they're so grateful and, and you don't want it to be awkward, you know, you're like, okay, you know, you don't have to follow me, you know, for several more days. You said thanks, we're all good. But, but there's all of a sudden there's this really cool relationship and, and there's this really cool thing that happens that now there's this gratefulness and that person that did that for you feels really good that you received it and you're so grateful and there's just this kind of this, I remember having that happen to me. I was the one that was given something and, and I was just so incredibly grateful for it and, and every time I would like see that person, it reminded me of what they had done for me and there was just kind of this cool little, like they would look at me and they didn't want me to fall down and just like, thank you, thank you, thank you. They just, they just wanted me to, to live out my gratefulness and there was just kind of this look and they would kind of look and you were like, that's what he says. That, so God can point to us in all the future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace. and kind. We're going to praise him and we're going to sing, we're going to sing and we're going to be praising God for eternity, but that's not all we're going to do. We're not going to just like sit down and that's all we do in heaven. We're going to be doing other things that God wants us to do. And I have to imagine every once in a while, you know, Jesus comes walking by and you look by and you're like, thank you, awesome, this is cool, couldn't ask for better. He says, I'm just going to point to them as, as, as examples and in the incredible wealth of grace and kindness. Verse 8, God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done, so none of us can boast about it. We are God's masterpieces. Let's hear that again. You are God's masterpiece. And, and, and not to just hang in a museum looking pretty. But he has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. See, whether we're parents or plumbers or prime ministers, we are God's masterpieces created in Christ Jesus to do the good things he planned for us already long ago. Let me encourage you to trust his plan and to follow his lead because he's the one writing your story. Trust his plan. Even when it doesn't make sense. Even when, when disappointments come, trust that he has a bigger plan in mind, that he has a bigger purpose to what you're going through and that he will work all these things for your good. This morning, we're going to, I asked the praise band to close us out this morning with a song they practiced this morning and it just connected. We're going to finish out with a song you never let go. Do you know that you have a God that will never let go of you? His plans cannot be thwarted. They will accomplish what he wants accomplished. Such a, such a good reminder that we have a God that never lets go of us. No matter where we're at, he's always got a hold of us. So why don't we stand this morning? Let's, uh, let's close out this morning with this song.